You know, I thought I knew what I was going to say. Um, very hard to follow. Uh, certainly, I'm Dr. Jackson. Um, everything I do seems really quite minimal compared to what he does. Um, he's actually concerned about your lives. I'm just concerned about whether they're pretty. Um, so I do think that <coughs> what I do is um, far less uh, important. Um, I do, of course, want to thank Richard. Um, it's a great honor to be here today. And I want to thank Michael as well, who I've known a great deal of time. I want to thank Dimitri for that lovely introduction. I want to congratulate Dr. Jackson on his work and his honor. Um, I want to thank the faculty of Notre Dame, the students of Notre Dame. And I very much want to thank my family and my friends who are in the audience today, as well as my partners. Um, I, unlike many people, understand that to make it to this podium is not the act of a single person. Um, I don't believe that uh, anybody gets there by themselves. Um, we only get there with the help of people caring about us and helping us to learn about the world. And I've been very fortunate to have an extraordinary group of people help me to understand humanism and conviction and help me to become the humanist architect I have. Um, it's uh, really a testament to all of those people um, who have participated in my life that my firm has been able to make the buildings we've made. Um, it is not my uh, skill, not my product. Um, it is the person that has been made and forged um, through the help and uh, caring of many, many people. Um, here we have a... Uh, it is um, these humanist values, these humanist values which I was raised, uh, that are represented in this Thomas Cole painting of um, 1840. Um, in this painting, a, a dream is presented which is coherent, clear, and it is a, a very interesting paradigm of what perfection is. Um, we can see that this is a distillation of a series of thoughts and principles that were very clear at that point in time. Uh, it's a different, very different place where that is the um, distillation of the dream than we find ourselves in today. Uh, what has come to control the architectural dialogue today is no longer the architecture of the continuum and our place on it, but simply the new. Um, to be new does not necessarily mean to be original. And it's important to remember that. Um, in our pressing need to be new, uh, we have turned to many different things aside from simply buildings uh, to find um, our inspiration for making new buildings. Sometimes we're aware of our sources, though sometimes they frequently come from images that are encoded in our memories and are represented in things that we've viewed many times in our past. Now, we can be pretty sure that Frank Gehry really didn't have a conversation with Marge Simpson, uh, but through this talk, we will see that precedent and inspiration come from very many unexpected places. Uh, but I think for the purposes of this talk, we should talk um, about our architectural tradition as it began and as we know it. Um, the architectural tradition of the Western world really did begin with the Greeks and with traditional Greek architecture. It's a style that has transcended the ages and been interpreted over them. Each age has made it its own. And we can see in this uh, series of images of a couple millennia um, that this has really been carried for 2,000 plus years from um, the Parthenon to um, architecture today. This approach to architecture is not limited to classicism. An iconic form can be carried forward and reinterpreted uh, over time, and we can see how this is done uh, with the Tower of Babel, uh, first represented here in the Van Bruegel painting, but as you can see, carefully carried forward in the traditions of the 20th century. Likewise, um, buildings have been designed with leaders, uh, likewise, many other buildings today, some designed by what we call the leaders of the avant-garde, still find their, their origins in history. Um, I don't think a lot of the people who are represented in this avant-garde would be particularly happy to have themselves unmasked. But if we look at this Eric Mendelssohn drawing of 1914, we can see a lot of what was portrayed as being original really has its origins deeply rooted in history. Not only do these buildings hark back to the Mendelssohn drawing, but they speak to themselves. Uh, I think the, the interaction between these two buildings and the understand between these buildings and the understanding of how they do speak to each other really has to begin to make us question what is new and what is not new in architecture. Um, our concert hall in Nashville clearly finds its origins in Schinkel's concert house in Berlin. So this notion of existing in the continuum can go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, I'm not sure that um, one of the partners at Skidmore was familiar with this comic from um, Weird Science, 
but of a decade earlier. But the resemblance between the two is really quite striking. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that the, our images and our references are things that can, we have can absorb in any number of different fashions. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I decided to start in 1900. It is an arbitrary date, but it is as good a place as any to look at the origins of architecture today. I think it is interesting to note as I go through this talk the differences in our approach to history that are taken by the winners of the Pritzker Prize and the Driehaus Prize. I think it is this attitude towards history that makes these two prizes so very, very different and so in many ways incompatible. Um, I do think um, that recognizing the distinction that exists between these two prizes is critical to understanding the importance of this prize. Um, as I go through this talk, you'll see little symbols um, under the pictures of Driehaus Prize winners and uh, Pritzker winners, just in case you can't tell the difference between the two. Uh, I think it's important to recognize um, that these are very, very different ways of approaching the built environment. Uh, the Driehaus Prize was, to create, uh, was created to celebrate uh, an architecture that finds its roots in history and evolution in the continuum. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call such an architecture an architecture of historicism. Uh, Mead, McKim, and White were clearly one of the greatest architects who chose to find their roots on the architectural continuum. If there is any doubt at all, we can just look at this picture of Grand Central Station compared to the um, lithograph of the Baths of Caracalla. Um, these are such direct representations of each other, it's hard to believe that Mead, McKim, and White were not entirely familiar with some of their early precedent. Again, we can easily see the precedent for Cass Gilbert's Woolworth Building in the Elm Cathedral. Likewise, we can see the origins of Frank Ford's entry for the Chicago Tribune Tower contribution co competition in the Tempe of, Temple of Athena Nike. Um, this sort of quoting can be done in any number of different ways to, um, and to very different effects. The past couple of images have shown an intent to display a seriousness of purpose, but this one is meant to bring our, a smile to our faces, a very appropriate building for the Walt Disney companies. And again, it is unsurprising but clear that Jack Robertson chose the form of the English country house um, to, to design a country club. After all, it was um, those houses that were the country clubs of their day. This the desire to exist within the, within the architectural continuum is clear of all the Driehaus winners. Bob Stern, the current reigning monarch of the kingdom of scholarly architecture, um, knew exactly what he was doing when he designed the Brooklyn Law School. as did we when we chose one of Louis Sullivan's jewel box banks as our paradigm for the rehearsal hall for Bass Hall. Clearly, the use of precedent is not something that is limited to one style. Uh, its origins can come from any number of different places. As we see in this set of slides, um, the, kind of the style of college Gothic clearly found its roots um, in, in Cambridge and Oxford, which chose to use college Gothic because before them, the church was the great provider of education and the provider of the greatest educations. Um, as a simple matter of advertising, the people who founded these two schools understood that they had to provide an education that would be viewed as being as good as the church did. So they aped their style. Uh, we have followed in that tradition, and we can see that tradition as we go to um, Gamble, um, James Gamble Rogers Colleges at Yale or Dimitri's College at, College at Princeton University. When we were hired to design the Palladium in Carmel, Indiana, um, a building that um, was very nicely referred to by Dr. Jackson, uh, we were confronted with the problem of designing a four-sided concert hall. Most concert halls only have one active side. Um, I think my favorite four-sided building has always been um, the Villa Rotunda. And I think many, many architects have always wanted to design a building based on the Rotunda, and I'm no different than that. We can look at the library at Harvard, um, lots and lots of different places. So we decided to use um, the Villa Rotunda for our paradigm for our concert hall. It seems appropriate to close this portion of my talk with a building by Tom Beebe. Um, after all, uh, Tom Beebe is um, a local hero uh, and an important one to be recognized here. But again, I think it's very easy to see um, Tom's inspiration uh, for his courthouse in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, I show you these series of slides because I think it's very important to understand the traditions that inform why we are here today, not necessarily the traditions of architecture today. Uh, that brings us to architecture as it's practiced today, which is a very, very different thing. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna call current avant-garde architecture the architecture of ahistoricism. 
Uh, and I use the word ahistoris as much as one would use the word asexual or amoral. Uh, and by this, mean, I mean an architecture uh, that, serve, that um, strives to obscure precedent and be less than honest about where, from where it comes. However, I don't think that as it started, people were really aware of, of, of what they were doing. I don't think Antonio Gaudi was trying to obscure the fact that his columns for the Park Well were highly reminiscent of the Temple of Karnak. And likewise, I don't think that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright spent a lot of time agonizing whether critics were going to recognize that the Johnson Wax Pavilion both came from uh, the Park Well and the Temple of Karnak. But I am quite sure that Paul Rudolph would not have been happy about this compar comparison between the Art and Architecture Building at Yale and the Larkin Building. Though if we look at the plans and the organizations of both buildings, they're really, really quite similar. And likewise, I think he would have shot anybody who chose to show Sid Bass this pair of slides, uh, comparing Sid's house to another very important Wright building. I don't know whether Caesar um, was familiar with uh, the um, Bibliothèque Nationale, though I suspect he was, he was a very urbane and well-educated person. Yet the striking between, there's a striking similarity between the Bibliothèque and National Airport. There came a point, however, where looking at buildings was not sufficient um, to find inspiration for our new buildings. Habitable buildings were no longer a sufficient paradigm. I think it's interesting that Corbusier chose to turn to nuclear power plants of a decade before uh, in order to build uh, this Palace of Assembly um, in 1963. Likewise, Rogers and Piano um, did not look at a built building for their inspiration for um, the Pompidou Center. So we've now gotten out of the place where we really look at buildings and places for people to make new places. We're prepared to look anywhere. Uh, Gordon Bunshaft chose um, um, this pillbox from World War II. But everything's fair game now. I, I, I do question, though, and I'm going to leave it up to you to decide whether a mailbox really should be a paradigm for a skyscraper in Denver or for that matter, whether a grandfather clock should be a paradigm for a building in a skyscraper in New York. You know, it really becomes uh, more remarkable when we begin to think that we're going to things that were never really meant to be in places for things that really are. Um, is the Millennium Falcon really the right paradigm for the four-stage reflector for IMP's um, concert hall in Dallas? But having done that, a record player certainly does is a questionable paradigm um, for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And Pei proudly proclaimed that the record player was his inspiration for this building. Uh, again, it's a very, very different way of looking at architecture than architecture that exists along the continuum. And if it was okay for I.M. Pei, it became okay for everybody. Um, and the emperor won. I mean, all of the elite decided they were going to buy their clothes from the same tailor who provided the emperor his. And so now we can see um, Fred and Ginger dressed by Hollywood and Fred and Ginger dressed by Frank Gehry or the Emperor. Um, but we've decided that we are really quite prepared um, to dress our buildings as we choose with no particular respect uh, for the architectural continuum. And since Frank made it okay to um, look at buildings and the like, uh, why not go to Jaws? I mean. Certainly, um, Daniel Liebskin was well aware of this image when he designed the museum in Toronto. Um, and the poor museum never knew what hit it. At least the folks on the boat knew what was coming. <laughs> so we've traveled to a place where architecture comes from anywhere. And if a museum can be from a, a, a movie, why can't it be a semi-truck? Why can't a library be a Polaroid camera? Uh, why can't a convention center be a Panasonic radio? And, you know, we really are going all out now, and I'm really convinced that Rem Koolhaas had to be really good friends with George Lucas. Uh, and it was good, if it was good enough for the Sandcrawler, why not a concert hall? I mean, it seems like the most appropriate way to design concert halls, don't you think? It's so clearly for people. It's so clearly a human environment. And was Rem Koolhaas a, a, a Star Wars fan as, as well? And a, a, how do we like the, um, uh, this gymnasium in um, Tokyo? And which do we think was a better paradigm for a building? And you know, if we can use the, um, the, the, the Falcon Millennium, why not the Alto Vase? 
Um, after all, the Alto vase as a library makes a lot of sense. Both the vase and the building hold things. One holds books, one holds flowers. No difference. And if we're going to go to that degree, why not just take cartoons and make them, give them form and make them real? Um, as we can see for these uh, presentations for a couple of buildings uh, that were designed in the um, late 90s, early 90s and early um, 2000s, um, all we have to do is look at this 1981 comic book, Adventures uh, from Adventure Comics, it's called Bizarro, to see the roots of, of some of the other buildings and architects that we've grown to know and have so much respect for. And if we're going to use comic books, the Simpsons certainly deserve, I mean, excuse me, the Jetsons certainly deserve to be amongst the ranks. Um, it's fascinating to me that we really have grown to accept taking precedent from anywhere and everywhere. Now we know that a nest can be a stadium, that a slice of Swiss cheese can become the learning center for one of the world's most iconic brands, and that an airplane terminal can become a house. But I really wonder whether we want our buildings to be bedpans. <laughs> so on that note, I want to bring us back to this moment uh, and to what brings us together here today, which is the issue of classicism. I think this, de this definition does a very good job of describing what we're interested in and why we're here. And the only question becomes what road we want to take back to the future, because it becomes quite clear that all roads forward look in the rearview mirror. Thank you. I, I also wanted to say, and I couldn't figure out where to put this in my prepared remarks, um, that I've decided to give my prize money to my firm's foundation, and we are going to use the money to encourage architectural education uh, in the hopes that we get things that look back at the architectural continuum rather than the things we normally find in hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. David. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Congratulations. This is epic. It is epic. <laughs> <laughs> You're a strong guy. <laughs>